on behalf of Columbia University, the Institute of Latin American Studies, and the Cuba program, I wish to welcome you to this evening's webinar, Update, Legal Trade and Investment in Cuba, which will provide us with some recent updates on what is being discussed not only in Washington, but also in Havana. The speakers today are Robert Muse and Gustavo Arnavat, whom I will introduce at greater length in a bit. First, I want to thank several of the people, including some behind the scenes, who have pulled together much of the preparations that putting together a webinar of this nature is. I am Dr. Margaret Crahan, the director of the Cuba program at the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. Our assistant who handles the webinar is Astrid Mercedes Leiden, and she will be with us for the remainder of the uh, semester. Another individual, a student from Columbia University, is Ambar Manuela Pagan, who has assisted us in producing the publicity, posters, flyers, and what have you. And we have a special guest this evening, Gretchen Sanchez, whom I think a good number of you will remember because she was the assistant at the Cuba program for almost three years, uh, particularly during the pandemic. And she is with us tonight um, because of her obviously ongoing interest in Cuba, her home country. And she will be with us, we hope, for the remainder of the semester, shadowing us to make sure we are behaving ourselves. Gretchen left the Cuba program to take a job at a major international law firm in Washington, where she is working 80 hours a week. So it's really a pleasure to have her here uh, and being able to join us for this evening's update on legal trade and investment in Cuba. This webinar will be recorded and videoed as all our we uh, webinars are, and it will be edited and posted both on YouTube and the website of the Institute of Latin American Studies Cuba program. So you will be able to go back and check things, but you also, if you think there's something that a colleague of yours would be interested in, you can recommend that they look for this either on YouTube or the Institute of Latin American Studies, Columbia University's website. The format will be a short presentation to set the scene by Robert Muse. And then we will go into a longer presentation by Gustavo Arnavat, who will bring us up to date on major developments within Cuba on the issue. We will then go back to Robert Muse, who will talk more extensively about how this fits into US-Cuba negotiations, some of which are currently going on. I want to mention something about the remainder of the spring semester 2023. Many of you have asked us to do something on the substantial exodus of Cubans, particularly in their age range 25 to 45 that have been leaving Cuba, some of whom have made it to the United States and requested asylum and others who are stacked up, quite frankly, at the US-Mexican border. That webinar will be on March 21st and it will feature Guillermo Grenier from Florida International University, who has 
been for the last few years the prime mover behind the Cuba survey that is done every two years on attitudes, political, economic, social attitudes within the Cuban American community. The second speaker will be Susan Eckstein, who has just published a new book on US regulations concerning Cuban citizens arriving in the United States. In April, we will have two webinars focusing on art. The first on April 11th, we'll look at trends in literature, painting, and architecture. The spokesperson on lit uh, literature will be Nancy Morejon, Cuba's leading poet. On painting, it will be Sand Sandy Levinson, the founder of the Cuban Art Space and the Cuban <coughs> Center for a uh, Cuban Studies Center. And the third person will be a visiting professor to uh, Columbia University, Angela Rojas from the University Kuhai in Havana on trends in architecture and preservation in Cuba. And on either April 17th or 18th, we will have a session including live music uh, together with New York University at New York University led by Junior Terry, who is a accomplished musician and his colleagues. And our final one will be an issue that a good number of you have mentioned you would like an update on. And that will be Robert Muse talking about what is legal about tra travel to Cuba. I'm now going to introduce briefly our speakers, our principal speakers tonight. Robert Muse has over 30 years of experience counseling companies and organizations on US laws and regulations relating to Cuba, particularly the Helms-Burton Act and the Cuban Asset Control Regulations. He has testified on the Helms-Burton Act before the Foreign Relations Committee of the US Senate, the Foreign Affairs and International Trade Standing Committees, of the Canadian House of Commons and the Ways and Means Committee of the US House of Representatives and the International Trade Commission. His legal studies were done primarily in England. And in addition, he has a master's in laws from Georgetown University. He will set the scene for us in terms of recent developments on the issue of trade and investment in Cuba. Our second speaker tonight is Gustavo Arnavas, who is the founder and the executive chair of the Cuba Foundation, a New York-based nonprofit, uh, non-governmental organization, which funds sustainable development projects that promote Cuba's private sector. He has spent over 30 years of his professional life advising in terms of legal, financial, and development issues, as well as national security. He was nominated by President Obama and confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate as a board member of the Inter-American Development Board and executive director of the Inter-American Development Bank. During that period, he was part of the U.S. Treasury's international affairs team. He led the negotiations within the IDB that resulted in the largest capital increase in the bank's history and the adoption of fundamental operating and financial reforms. Gustavo Anervat received a BA cum laude from Cornell University, a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania. As I mentioned, our format will be setting the scene by Robert Muse. Then we will turn to Gustavo Arnavat, 
to focus primarily on Cuba. And then we will go back to Robert Muse to discuss more of US legal developments of late. And then we will open up for questions and answers. You will see at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A app. Please put your answers there. I will gather the answers together and present them to the speakers. If you put something in chat, I may miss it, quite frankly, because it's only me attending both. So now we will go to Robert Muse. Bob. Thank you, Meg. And thank you, everyone who organized this evening's event. Uh, as Meg said, I want to begin by setting the stage. Gustavo will talk at some length about what I think is a momentous law in Cuba that for the first time since the revolution truly legitimizes private industry in Cuba. Uh, one material difference between the quintuprupistas you've heard of, the small businesses of Cuba, paladars, taxi drivers, that uh, there were several infirmities in that, uh, in that small area of private enterprise. One, they were designated as self-employed uh, they would stretch it here and there and employ a person or two, but they were stunted in their ability to grow by the fact that they weren't really legal entities. Uh, what's changed is that the law, the new Cuban law enacted in 2021 that allowed the formation of LLCs, limited liability companies, that can employ, depending on the size of the company, they're often called small, uh, medium, and uh, micro, small, and medium. The medium size is the largest a company can be, but it's 100 employees. So there's a real dynamic that's emerging in Cuba that I've seen in the last couple of trips I've made. As recent, one as recently as a month ago. The Biden administration didn't really react to this important event. And I think the problem was that it came shortly after the public demonstrations, uh, protests are characterized in different ways that occurred in Cuba in July of 2021. It put uh, the Biden administration on its back foot. They have said widely they were about to implement, rescind some of the punitive Trump measures from his time in office, including resumption of relative remittances. As we know, they didn't do it. Uh, I think they were somewhat paralyzed by those events and the aftermath of prosecutions of, of demonstrators in Cuba. But what I'm going to suggest later tonight as I return to these. Uh, the issues of what U.S. companies primarily can do with this emerging private sector in Cuba. The news is good. Uh, the regulations as written, even though they haven't been modified by the Biden administration to accommodate this new development, allow a surprising amount of commerce to and from Cuba. Uh, the investment, uh, I'll talk about little about that and a license granted uh, last spring that authorized investment in a Cuban private company. The, my final thought before we go to Gus is that it's my belief that U.S.-Cuba policy will be driven from Havana. I think that's been true for a long time, but it's particularly true, I think, at this point. And I think the emergence of private businesses in Cuba. One of the critiques of the Biden, of the uh, Barack Obama normalization initiative is it neglected uh, trade commerce with Cuba in favor of other modifications of the regulations. If the Cuban newly emerging private sector can gain uh, a competitive footing attract U.S. trade and investment, I think it would be the most important uh, impetus available to terminating the embargo. Uh, 
among other things, I think it will bring players into that uh, that debate that have been largely missing in the past. No matter what people say, the U.S. corporate sector has expended very little money or energy in ending the embargo in Cuba. But I think we'll all be watching events in Cuba with with great attention, and I'm now looking forward to what Gus tells us. Manga, I'm going to assume that you want me to speak. So I'm going to go ahead and start speaking. So thank you. Uh, first, I want to join uh, Bob and Meg in, in thanking everyone that they thanked. But I especially want to want to thank uh, Meg, uh, who has been such a, a leader uh, in, in the Cuba issues for so many years um, you know, out, of, out of Columbia University, certainly. And my good friend, Bob Muse, who I consider to be the dean of the OFAC Cuba Bar, uh, US, you know, Cuba sanctions are complicated. Uh, are either liberalized or tightened at least once per presidential term and in high correlation with congressional or presidential elections. This is all probably a coincidence, I'm sure. Um, it takes really someone with Bob's intellect, uh, experience, and ability to conduct dispassionate legal analysis to effectively uh, advise clients. Um, it also takes someone who is uh, risk averse to ask me to join him uh, on this panel. Uh, as Meg mentioned, I am the founder and head of the Cuba Foundation, which is a philanthropic platform that uh, connects purposeful donors with sustainable development projects in Cuba with a focus on private sector solutions. Uh, we're not political or, or lobbying organization. We simply focus on helping the Cuban people in legal, tangible, and impactful ways that emphasize the private sector. Uh, my presentation today uh, is my own and does not necessarily reflect the views of the, the Cuba Foundation. Now, having said that, uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of major uh, areas. Uh, first is Cuba's recent and significant legal initiative to promote um, and foment economic activity through the private sector, namely the authorization of micro, uh, micro pequeñas y medianas empresas, otherwise known as MIPIMES, uh, and how foreign direct investment relates in relation to that initiative. Um, first, a little bit of background on what I see uh, as Cuba is dealing with not only the private sector, but I would call private wealth accumulation, which I think is very much part of the analysis the Cuban government has been undertaking for a number of years. Uh, as everyone knows or should know by now, uh, Cuba underwent a political, social, and economic revolution in 1959, uh, which led to the confiscation and nationalization of private commercial property. Uh, notwithstanding the enormous brain drain that resulted uh, in the imposition of a trade, financial, and economic embargo by the United States starting in the early 1960s, which continues today, uh, Cuba's economy chugged along more or less because of subsidies uh, and the assistance provided by the Soviet Union and its socialist uh, allies. That largesse came to a screeching halt uh, with the implosion of the Soviet bloc, uh, causing Cuba to go into a steep economic uh, decline from which is, is it not really fully recovered, uh, in my estimation, I think the estimation of many, many economists. As a result, the Cuban government began to allow some limited private sector activities in order to increase economic opportunities for Cubans uh, as the state began to restructure and employees began, began to find themselves redundant. Cubans were allowed to establish restaurants and boarding houses, but subject to severe limitations, such as, for example, uh, initially the number of chairs that could be found in the restaurant was 12. Uh, at some point that was increased to about 100 or something like that. Now, not surprisingly, these entrepreneurs began to accumulate wealth and contribute to the economy, but they could only, uh, as, as, uh, as Bob mentioned, they could only operate as individuals with limited legal protections and abilities to raise capital to Cuba's banking system. In other words, they lacked a very useful mechanic, a me mechanism to spur economic development that is that exists and is present in virtually every other country in the world, which is the, the corporate form. Uh, during the Obama opening, especially many potential U.S. investors, subject of course to the U.S. embargo, were disappointed to learn uh, that it was very difficult to invest formally or legally in Cuba's growing private sector. Uh, there was no secret, uh, I mean this was no secret, uh, and for many years there was open discussion about the need to adopt this mechanism, as well as rumors that the government was very close to establishing this business form. Bob, you may remember that any given time, you know, we were hearing rumors that the government was about uh, to publish 
uh, these uh, these norms uh, for incorporating uh, companies. Uh, and that, that didn't take place until August of 2021. I should note, however, that many Cuban Americans especially did make in, uh, investments informally uh, through family and friends, uh, although this was always contrary or usually contrary to the US embargo and also Cuban law. So in, uh, in August of 2021, the government published uh, through the official gazette, uh, law, law Decree 46. Its, uh, its purpose uh, is to facilitate, uh, and I'm more or less paraphrasing what the, uh, what, what, the, what, what the law says, is to facilitate the coherent establishment of MIPIMAS within Cuba's legal framework as an actor that affects, the word they use in Spanish is incide, which I, which I take to mean has kinetic properties. It's not just a passive player, but, but affects the country's productive transformation. They use the term transformación productiva del país. Now, for anybody who has studied uh, you know, Marxism uh, and Marxist economies, and of course, Cuba's economy, uh, until you know, certainly a few years ago, as you know, uh, the Cubans and the Cuban constitution always reflected the importance of the state owning the means of production. So I'm, uh, I believe that the drafters of this law use those terms uh, on purpose to indicate that they're okay, basically, with other actors, not just the state, being involved with, a produ with, you know, with production um, in, the, in society. Now, what is the critical result of this was the creation of entities separate from their owners, that is, with their own legal personality through which the private sector can participate in various economic activities. Um, previously, and it's still the case, that many individuals could participate or can participate on their own as cuentrapopistas, uh, which is a keen, more or less a sole of, of proprietorship, I would say, in the United States. Not exactly the same, but basically you can do this on your own. You do have to have a license, uh, but it's not the same thing. It doesn't provide you any of the kinds of uh, uh, any protections. Um, it doesn't give you any of the, of the rights that me peepers uh, do. Now, I want to go over some of the key elements of this law. There are many. I don't have time you know, to discuss just a few. So I'm going to try to focus on the ones that I consider uh, the most, uh, among the most uh, uh, important ones. Uh, it, you know, in general, it sets forth a comprehensive fashion um, about the organizational and governance provisions for legalized payments, their, their characteristics uh, and obligations. It's no different from other similar uh, corporate codes that I've seen throughout my experience as an attorney and as a, and as a banker whenever I do due diligence on companies throughout Latin America. Um, the first is the legal form. Now, not everyone on this call, in fact, I assume very few people are attorneys, uh, but the technical legal term for the form is a Sociedad de Responsabilidad Limitada, or SRLs, Limited Liability Company. And in fact, as, as Bob mentioned, is very, very similar to LLC structures found in the US and I think uh, various uh, forms you know, throughout uh, the world. Now, technically speaking, if we were all lawyers, I would probably refer to them not as MIPIMAS, but at SRLs, uh, but I'm gonna to continue to refer to them as MIPIMAS. Um, but basically it means the same thing as a uh, small and medium sized enterprise. Although interestingly enough, the Cubans like to use the, the term at the beginning of that of micro, um, which is interesting. When I was at the IDB, we uh, often uh, made loans to banks who would make loans to SMEs throughout the region because of the importance that these institutions, these com companies uh, play in generating um, income. Uh, but it was always PEMIS, not me PEMIS. In any event, this is what the Cubans came up with. Um, and there are basically three sizes for these me PEMIS. Uh, you have one to 10 employees. These are the micro. 35 to 100, I'm sorry, 11 to 35, which are small, and 35 to 100, which are uh, which are the maximum. And these are considered to be medium-sized enterprises. And there are also three types of MIPIMAS, depending on the ownership. So you've got private MIPIMAS, and these are the ones that are 100% owned by natural persons or you know, individuals. There are state-owned MIPIMAS, and these are 100% owned by the state or state entities. And then they're, they're mixed, which is a combination of private and, and, uh, and the state. Now, what the law provides is that subject to Cuba's constitution, its laws and regulations, the PMIS have full autonomy. Uh, and what are, and some of those limitations are, they have full autonomy to do a broad range of things that I don't think before were really contemplated under Cuban law. And this is manage their affairs, decide on which goods and services produce, whom to sell to, set prices and terms of sales, 
make hiring decisions, decide how much to pay employees, subject, of course, to minimum wage laws, open and maintain bank accounts, borrow and find uh, other forms of financing, import and export. It's, it's a very clear indication that the government uh, starting when they uh, when they you know, came up with the, the concept of Puente Robistas um, or Trabajadores por, por Cuenta Propia, uh, that they continue to move away, if deliberately and cautiously, from a 100% uh, central planning model of production. Now, I mentioned that uh, BPMIS can do this subject to other legal norms. And of course, that's the, uh, that's the fine print, as lawyers uh, might say. So one of the more, most important limitations imposed by those other norms is with respect to prohibited sectors of the economy or activities. In February 2021, the government switched their approach to regulating private enterprise from an explicit list of permitted activities to the opposite, an explicit list of prohibited activities, or the so-called negatives list. Now, this negative list includes 124 activities. By the way, it's in, in, in contrast to about 2,000 activities that um, that by implication are, are legal, but these are big ones. Uh, so including some obvious ones, of course, such as, you know, you can't engage in the illicit production of narcotics. You can't engage in national defense or public administration, but others that indicate that the government is still intent on controlling vast amounts of the economy, such as mining, healthcare, sugar production, energy exploration, generation and distribution public or freight transportation, media or press, and professional services, so such as ordinary science, and plain employment services. Um, as far as what, uh, how, how could we go about establishing a BIMA? So they are established by submitting an application to Cuba's Ministry of the Economy and Planning, and they become viable uh, once they are publicly registered uh, and, their, and their corporate information appears in Cuba's commercial registry. And this is very typical you know, throughout the world. Um, they can be formed by one or more shareholders. However, for private BPMIS, these are the ones that can only be owned uh, by, um, by the private sector, if you will. In other words, no, there's no state entity involved. Only natural adult citizens of Cuba can be shareholders. So in other words, no foreign shareholders can participate in private BPMIS by operational law. Only state entities can be shareholders of state MIPIMAS. And for mixed MIPIMAS, only shareholders who are state entities or natural persons, which could include non-Cuban natural and artificial persons or, or, corporate, or corporate entities uh, may invest. So clearly the government is signaling that it will only permit foreign investment in MIPIMAS in partnership with at least one state-owned entity. Uh, in addition to having uh, to be approved by the Ministry of the Economy and Planning, all foreign investments uh, or the participation of foreign investor in MEP man, would have to be approved by the Ministry of International Commerce and Foreign Investment, or mean sex, which can be a very bureaucratic process, as um, I'm sure lots of you know, people have encountered. Uh, so this will be, uh, it'll be a very effective test to see how interested the Cuban officials are in allowing for foreign investment from outside of, of Cuba. In addition, no natural person who is a shareholder in either a private MIPIME or a mixed MIPIME, uh, uh, in this case, it would, it would have to be a Cuban, uh, a Cuban uh, natural person uh, together with, uh, you know, with, a, with a state entity, can be a shareholder in other MIPIMEs. So as a natural individual, you can only be uh, an owner of one MIPIME. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, the reason for this is, I think, is kind of obvious. Cuba underwent a socialist revolution. And even though the economy has underperformed for many years, its leadership and many residents, I think, are loath to return to the days of highly concentrated wealth accumulation and all that this could imply from the perspective of political power, uh, redistribution, as well as economic and social inequality. This is what you hear uh, from many people uh, in, in Cuba. And it just makes sense, uh, given their... Um, you know, given their, their founding, given their background. Now, finally, no natural person who is a public employee or elected official may be a shareholder in a MIPIME. So this obviously addresses some of the concerns about MIPIMAs being used by corrupt uh, government officials. Now, what have the results been so far? Since Law Decree 46 went into effect in September 2001, 
and through the end of last month, that is September 2023, 1,296 have been authorized. Last month, just in the month of January, 111 were approved and all but one were private MEPMIS. Uh, the vast majority uh, are private MEPMIS. Uh, I think less, from my, based on my, uh, my count, less than 2% of MEPMIS are state-owned uh, MEPMIS. Um, but not all, not all of these are new enterprises or, or businesses. That is, 52% are actually conversions from cuenta propistas or other forms of doing business. 48%, however, are in fact new enterprises. I'm told that so far about six uh, MIPIMES have been approved that include uh, foreign investment. Now, is this a success? Um, I guess it depends on how you view it. Uh, in absolute terms, it is. Over 6,000 in less than 14 months or whatever it is, uh, seems like in absolute terms, a pretty significant number. But keep in mind that this number represents but a tiny portion of the 600,000 Cubans who make a living through the private sector activities primarily through cuenta propista activities. Uh, and I should also mention that not all cuenta propistas are necessarily rushing to form a PIMIS. Uh, there are administrative reporting and tax obligations uh, that weigh on them uh, in the same way that other entrepreneurs around the world are concerned about excessive reporting uh, and record keeping requirements and the payment of taxes. Cubans after all are part of the human race. Uh, the reality is that many have become comfortable uh, navigating, and I don't mean this in a negative way, uh, but comfortable navigating through Cuba's informal economy with its often vague uh, and lightly enforced regulatory environment that are that are taking their time. And so they're taking their time to decide how to uh, proceed. Uh, I think that um, that this will change over time because it is in everyone's interest uh, to do so. From my perspective at the Inter-American Development Bank, where Cuba is not, I hasten to say, a member uh, the, the, the greater the integration into a, the formal economy, the better the outcomes for the aggregate economy uh, and the vast majority of existing entrepreneurs. Uh, more importantly, uh, now that we have a formal legal basis for the organization and management of MIPIMAS, it is only rational to conclude that private sector activities and the experience of entrepreneurs will be enhanced through this formal channel. Uh, but it's up to Cuban officials to ensure that the incentives and protections are in place uh, to induce entrepreneurs to avail themselves of this channel. Now, many uh, initially when the law was published were disappointed. They thought the law did not go far enough, uh, given lots of different things. One, how long Cuban officials had been considering the law. Two, given the uh, multiple, uh, excuse me, examples around the world uh, that they had access to, uh, given the fact that they have, Cuba does have some excellent uh, economists and lawyers uh, and other officials. Uh, in other words, this is this is intellectually is not as challenging as some other things that they have to tackle with. Um, uh, and of course, when you see the law itself, a lot of people felt that they did not go far enough. Uh, for one thing, the negative list that has to be read in in concert with this uh, with this law uh, includes uh, many many activities that are still important. Uh, there are also restrictions on the number of employees, as I mentioned, as Bob mentioned also. Uh, you can't hire more than 100 employees, which is an arbitrary uh, number, of course. There's no rhyme or reason uh, to that number. Um, it indicates, again, that the Cubans are a little worried uh, about, um, about this, uh, this type of uh, private sector initiative, uh, perhaps growing a little bit too quickly um, and, 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 and wealth being accumulated you know, too, too quickly. And I'm reminded again, as I said earlier, of the previous provisions when it came to limitations, the number of chairs in restaurants that started out as 12, and then it was gradually increased uh, to, to 100. Um, there are also restrictions on the ability of natural persons who are partners to invest in multiple MIPIMAs. This of course is contrary to the way that lots of people, certainly in the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, do business. And of course in the United States, not to mention um, lots of other countries around the world. Uh, and of course, there was some uncertainty about how many uh, MIPIMAs would be uh, authorized by the Ministry of the Economy and Planning and how quickly they would do so. I think this last concern has been proven to be unwarranted, um, but the other areas will continue to cause some concern. I should mention that 346 uh, 
does provide um, for, for a review to be conducted by the Ministry of the Economy and Planning uh, about two years after it was released. So in August of this year, uh, there will be a review connect, uh, conducted by the ministry, which should contain an evaluation of its findings in connection with the implementation of the law and recommendations for modifications. Uh, my understanding is that the University of Havana has established a red emprendimiento through which entrepreneurs can discuss and channel their observations, uh, but there's no reason why academics and other experts on entrepreneurship can't weigh in by publishing studies uh, and uh, with their own recommendations. Now, look, there's a saying that half a loaf is better than no loaf. I, I subscribe to that uh, in this case. Perhaps in this case, half a loaf is too generous. It might be 10% or 15% of a loaf, but at least we have a loaf of bread. At least we can imagine what the rest, what the other 85 uh, or 90% looks like. And, I'm, and of course, I'm, I'm challenging a vision of a nice you know, Cuban, uh, Cuban bread um, nice and hot uh, of the of the oven. Um, the the adaptation uh, is um, is directionally positive, I think, and there's cause to be optimistic that as as the state incorporates uh, more MIPIMAS and they begin to move the economy in a positive way, that the state will become increasingly open to removing activities from the negative list, and other restrictions will be lifted to meet the needs of a growing uh, private sector. Now, before finishing, because I think I still have a good uh, five or ten minutes. I just want to make some, some observations based on my own experiences of, of traveling to Cuba beginning in 2015, uh, right after the Obama opening. I'm often asked uh, whether uh, this is for real. And I've been asked that question um, you know, for a number of years. Is Cuba really serious about the private sector? So these are my observations. Um, you know, Cuba has had a tendency to pull back from private sector and foreign investment reforms as soon as the country's economic situation begins to improve. There's been a pattern of that I think a lot of people have observed. Uh, saw some of this, uh, saw, some, saw this occur in the aftermath of President Obama's visit to Havana in 2016. I have to tell you, when I first began to travel to Cuba in the spring and summer of 2015, I saw a lot of excitement on the part of, uh, of, of people who were excited about I mean, I think they were projecting, they were thinking the embargo was gonna be uh, lifted. And of course, uh, that was not to be the case, but I think that they were very excited at the possibility of doing business with the United States and benefiting from those commercial uh, ties. Now, I left Cuba when I was very young. I was six years old and I didn't return until you know many years later. So I can't, I can't compare uh, the, um, you know, how people were feeling uh, immediately for the Obama opening. But I can compare my observations uh, and their moods, at least my perception of their moods, based on more recent trips. And I can tell you that that um, you know those expectations have been dashed greatly uh, because of the uh, Trump administration uh, policies, and because I think we have to be candid of uh, the failure of the Biden administration uh, to return to some of President Biden's own policies when he was Vice President of the United States. Um, so there definitely is uh, less hope now than it was before. Um, now, um, I, I, just going back to what I said about President Obama's trip and, and why it appeared that officials began to slow down uh, the process of reform. The, at one point, they stopped issuing licenses for new cuenta propistas. I think officials in Cuba uh, there, I think they suspected the U.S. was too eagerly pushing for private sector reforms and for U.S. investment as a way of introducing what some would call the Trojan horse uh, into the island. Um, my, you know, my sense is that while slow, the changes we see are part of a necessary and natural progression that a country with a centralized planning economy in the 21st century uh, would need to embark upon. It is noticeable, noticeable to me that in, in 2005, uh, when I first traveled to Cuba, almost no government officials and many entrepreneurs uh, refused to use the term private sector. Instead, they used non-state sector. And these days, I think everyone seems to be using the former, or rather the, um, yeah, the former without any, without much hesitation. Uh, many Cubans uh, have been leaving the island in recent years in response to the island's uh, economic difficulties. But the vast majority of, when you do the analysis, the vast majority of Cubans never left Cuba. Uh, and many who have, had the opportunity to leave, uh, continue to stay because 
They love their country, not unlike many people who love their country. Uh, it is the country they are familiar with, uh, where their family, social, and professional networks exist. There are many uh, who are interested in pursuing private enterprise, and both the Cuban and US governments, I think, should take advantage of their energy, their resilience. I've, I don't think I've ever met people more resilient than Cubans on the island, uh, and educational training to drive pri private sector employment and growth. I'll, and I'll fi finish with this. In a recent speech in Havana, uh, which is live streamed, by the way, which I found very interesting, uh, Carlos Fernandez de Cosillo, who is uh, the vice, the deputy minister, uh, vice minister of Cuba's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, essentially called the bluff on the Trojan horse theory um, uh, and, uh, and underscored his confidence that the Cuban revolution would not wither because of foreign investment. Uh, he challenged the US to encourage investment in the island and to facilitate that investment. Um, since the Obama opening, I have never heard any Cuban official make that argument. Instead, there has been hesitation. Seems to me that Cuba is on its way to enter the 21st century from a corporate, legal, and private sector perspective, at least with respect to, uh, to SMEs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. We will now turn to Robert Muse. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, I'm now going to talk about what US businesses can do with these new enterprises in Cuba. Uh, a separate question is to the extent Cuba will adopt regulations allowing inward investment. That's not clear. It's not clear uh, what strictures it may put on its domestic newly emerging private enterprises when it comes to uh, dealing with US companies. But for now, I'm going to take the view that uh, as Gus has pointed out, Cuba has committed to the sector. It uh, the arguments often made that, well, uh, it was in extremis that they came to that. Uh, at this point, I suggest it doesn't really matter. I think they why they did it, they've done it. And Vice Minister uh, Fernandez de Cosillo, again, as Gus said, was very direct when he said, we know that the U.S. will use this law to try to promote its policy objectives in Cuba, which are uh, in the Cuban view, which is displacement of the current government. In the US uh, view, it's to bring democracy in to Cuba. But he said, we know they're gonna do it and we know they're going to favor in their licensing some companies over others in that they think they may accelerate uh, policy goals in Cuba. Uh, it's long been the belief of uh, some pro-embargo supporters have made an exception for economic engagement with Cuba because they believe a small independent uh, sector, economic autonomy is a form of political space in some ways. And they believe the evolution of that private sector may have transformational capacities. I think that's oversaid, but the Cubans are very sensitive to that, but they've said, in short, bring it on. When thinking about the US, what any US national, including companies can do in Cuba or with Cuba, you start from an inversion of the Western legal tradition that is all, everything that is not prohibited is permitted. Uh, in the case of the embargo on Cuba, anything that is not permitted is prohibited. Uh, you might be surprised to learn, some of you, that you can't give a gift to a Cuban. It's a prohibited transaction. So don't imagine the embargo is only limited to commercial intercourse. It's, it's far broader than that. So then one other uh, preliminary point. The, the embargo on Cuba as a policy construct has had a variety of um, uh, rationales or, or objectives over the years. The first one was to try to force negotiations over expropriated US property in 1960. That was replaced 
uh, Bay of Pigs or a number of political confrontations. And then the embargo became an instrument of uh, regime change in Cuba. And it's stalled at that level for quite a long time. Uh, now, there's a tension between US laws relating to Cuba, harming Cuba economically. OFAC, the Treasury Department, principally charged with enforcing the embargo, sees embargoes as a form of economic warfare. The Cuban regulations exist under the Trading with the Enemy Act, enacted in 1917 uh, and aimed at Kaiser Wilhelm. Economic warfare. But policymakers have at different times tried to mitigate that uh, aggression, recognizing it can harm the Cuban people. So there's this tightrope that we fall off of frequently, not we, but people uh, formul formulating US policy. How far do you go? And you'll see some of this in what I'm gonna talk about in a moment. So there are two regulatory uh, bodies that are important in US businesses doing business with these new enterprises in Cuba. One is OFAC, as I mentioned, and the second is the Commerce Department, BIS, uh, that's in charge of export licensing. Uh, I suggest in the early days of uh, it, assuming a US uh, economic interest develops in Cuba, that most of the activity will be in the export sector. And I'll explain where I think some of the movement is in that. Uh, OFAC is, when we talk about investment, one step beyond trade, investment in Cuba can only occur with the specific license granted by, Q, by the OFAC, the Treasury Department. And I'm going to, at, toward the end, I'm going to argue for some policy determinations at OFAC that would expedite and favor US investment in Cuba. So beginning with, uh, I think most of you know the difference between a general license and a specific license. General license, if you qualify, you just do it. A specific, is all tra most all travel to Cuba now falls under those. If you're eligible to go, you get on a plane. Specific licenses are involved, principally it's done by letter, a thorough exposi exposition of what you want to do, why you feel you need a license, what regulatory authority and policy authority argues in favor of them granting it. And then you hope there's, uh, OFAC is an imperious government agency. So, and your recourse is not great if they disappoint you, if they don't give you something you want. So if OFAC is going to do its job in facilitating US trade and investment in Cuba, it's going to do so in pursuit of policy decisions that are made by Department of State, National Security Council, to a degree Department of Defense, and the White House itself. So the first uh, element of OFAC regulation are remittances. And I'm not talking about uh, relative remittances, which have been reinstituted, but also donative remittances are relevant to us. That's where you just give the money to a Cuban. There's no uh, requirement they be a family member. There's no limit on what you can give. There's some practical issues at the other end, but it's essentially unlimited. Uh, you can give money to Cuban nationals as a remittance to, if it encourages the development of private businesses and operation and the operation of economic activity in the non-state sector by self-employed individuals. So now at the bottom of that regulation, it says this provision does not permit investment in Cuba, but I'm sure there's some smart lawyers out there that could uh, 
think themselves to the point where you could make a donative remittance for somebody to buy the equipment to produce something you want to uh, engage in, either investment exports from Cuba, and treat that donation as perhaps a pre-investment. It, uh, it requires some rather uh, adroit lawyering, but I think it can be done. So remittances, very small opening there. The second thing that you can do in Cuba under a general license from OFAC, again, in combination with these new Cuban businesses, is establish physical and, bus uh, physical and business presence in Cuba. It's a very broad provision. It allows you to rent, renovate. Uh, uh, you can hire Cuban nationals. You can have expat, you can have uh, non-domiciled U.S. employees working for you in any licensed activity in Cuba, in our particular case, involving exports. So you're free to open those. You can do it in the free trade zone. You can do it anywhere in Cuba, and you can assemble any equipment you ship to Cuba under the export regulations I'm going to get to in a moment. So uh, I'll come back to OFAC to talk again about investment in Cuba and describe a license that was issued uh, in May of 2022 and discuss some of the implications of that. Uh, so license exceptions, the way export licensing works is, and it's at the its highest level in the case of a terrorist sponsoring nation, Cuba, to my view, sadly, is on that list, and it's a fully embargoed country. So export licensing as it is, is at its highest level with Cuba. Uh, but they grant licenses in only very limited circumstances. So you're the best bet when you're looking at exporting to Cuba is license exceptions. That's how most all the agricultural commodities go to Cuba. A license exception is like a general license from OFAC. If you qualify, you just do it. You don't go to uh, the Commerce Department and ask for a specific OFAC license. Uh, the regulation that's of probably the most importance in this regard is license exception support for the Cuban people. It, Exempts from licensing items for, items for use by Cuba's private sector for private sector economic activities. That's pretty broadly written. So even with the Quinta Propistas, you could send a pizza oven to Cuba, you could export it because it's going to be used by Paladar and so on. So think of expanding that, uh, supporting uh, items for use by Cuba's private sector. What I saw when I was in uh, in Cuba six weeks ago, I was taken to an old Soviet battery factory, abandoned fa factory. It must have been 25,000 square feet. And they, one of these, I guess this business would be mid-sized, must have had 50 people working there, were packaging and distributing imports coming in from the United States. United States goods were being exported into Cuba and they were distributing it around Havana. Right? It was a very sophisticated enterprise of packaging, getting it to the right people. So, but the key was that they were able to import items for use by Cuba's private sector for private sector economic activities. That would include a small truck. It would include a shrink wrapping machine. It would include any of the uh, commodities that could be purchased from the United States. So if you're in private sector activity in Cuba, you can buy equipment, supplies, and these things from a U.S. supplier. Uh, and again, I think that's probably going to be the provision of the export rigs that produces the most initial activity. 
but we all know Cuba's broke, right? So how does Cuba pay for all of this? Uh, this is where I think we come back to OFAC investment licensing that the license I applied for and got in May of 2022 is the first one I'm aware of that was granted since Kennedy put the embargo on Cuba in its in a present form in 1963. It allows for an equity investment. A US company is licensed to invest money into a Cuban corporation and gain an ownership interest in the company itself. It has a profit sharing provisions in it and it also has an interest-bearing loan component. OFAC granted the application, I think, because back to this tension between uh, an economic blockade of Cuba, but also uh, empowering the private sector in Cuba. Uh, so picture you want to go into an investment with these Cubans I've described who are uh, distributing goods around Cuba, importing and distributing, or you want to go into a partnership uh, with a uh, uh, direct producer in Cuba that produces something that would be sold into the hotel sector or even for export to the US, which I'll come to in a moment. You would need an OFAC license. I think a well-tailored, well-written application that again, articulates, they've said it a dozen times, Blinken said it, they've all said it, that they support the private sector in Cuba. This is how you can do it. Let me invest in a joint venture in Cuba where we can buy the equipment to empower this newly formed company to succeed. And without US capital, much of the development of that sector I think is uh, more theoretical than real. Uh, There'll be some Europeans will come into it and invest in these companies, but I think the principal driver has to be the United States. Uh, just a note on bilateral trade, you can import, another form of commerce, is the importation into the US of goods and services by Cuban entrepreneurs. Services are unlimited, there's no restriction on them. So, I haven't visited one yet, but I've heard of uh, computer programming, uh, a lot of stuff that used to be offshored. Uh, I'm not so sure about call centers. Some of you will be more aware of this, but a form of uh, making code, providing uh, IT services, that's already underway in Cuba. There are some of the things you can't yet bring in are prepared foodstuffs, beverages, and so on. I, but State Department takes the view that it can easily change this. Anything prohibited, it can, by fiat, uh, permit. At the moment, coffee and charcoal are coming into the US. They have to be uh, produced by Cuba's private sector, though, and it takes us back to where we began, these uh, small and mid-sized businesses. 100 hardworking Cubans is quite an enterprise. So I would not underestimate their ability to produce, but they need capital. And I think that's got to come, my final words on the subject. I'd like to see OFAC take this straight up, not game it, not worry that if someone wants to, an American investor wants to invest in the renovation of a historic building in Cuba and convert it to a boutique hotel. I hope OFAC doesn't game the application and think, well, this, this serves the foreign tourists or US tourists, puts hard currency into Cuba. I hope we can abandon that ancient uh, perspective and elevate the success of this new private sector, because I think that that is where most long-term US political goals and policy goals are going to be realized. And that's all I've got to say on that.
And now I guess we take questions, Meg. Yeah, our, uh, I'm going to start with Gustavo. Do you have any comments or questions for Bob? No, no, I, I, I don't. I mean, Bob, you're, of course, in Washington, D.C., and I'm just curious to see, uh, given the, the results of the midterm elections, and, you know, especially in Florida, you know, last year, whether you think there's less pressure on the Biden administration uh, to hold the line when it comes to being very strict on, on Cuba. Do you see any, any changes there, potentially? Well, popular wisdom is that Florida is out of the Democratic presidential column for... <laughs> probably most of our lifespans, right? So you don't have to worry about how, how, how Florida is going to vote. And therefore, it offsets the Cuban-American advantage, the hard, the embargo supporting Cuban-Americans in famous episodes like Gore versus Bush. Uh, they could be said to be the margin of victory in a close jump ball election. It looks like, I read something like of only about 15 or 20 percent of the people who've moved to Florida, a lot of them during the COVID episode, have registered as Democrats. You know, it's a almost it's pumping up that Republican stronghold. So that's not really an issue. It was, I think, largely pretextual anyway. Uh, how does Cuba play in presidential elections? I would say not at all. If you had a list of 100 things on the mind of an American voter when thinking about a presidential candidate. I would put, Cuba wouldn't make that list in my view. So just sure. do it. I, I am reminded, of course, uh, we're a couple of hours away from Biden's um, uh, State of the Union speech. And I'm reminded that uh, the last two State of the Union speeches given by Obama, he highlighted his Cuba uh, uh, policy. And also the last speech that he gave a few days before he left office, this was in Chicago, uh, 2017, uh, uh, I guess it was, uh, in the same uh, either sentence or paragraph that he was mentioning some of his major accomplishments, including the Affordable Care Act, he mentioned the opening towards Cuba. So clearly uh, at the time, you know, there were people in the White House who felt very strongly uh, about how a different approach uh, would be better for U.S. Uh, national security, commercial, uh, cultural interest. Uh, so some, so you know, so some of that thinking was around when when Biden was in office, certainly. Yeah, uh, I, I think some of the problems with that initiative, John Kerry, just before the election in 2020, said that uh, he didn't think Cuba had gone far enough uh, to meet U.S. Uh, what he I think I believe he termed as concessions. Uh, that worried me a bit because Joe Biden is an old style retail politician. If he wants an opinion on something, he calls his friends. Mercifully, now, uh, Chris Dodd is available for that role. But he might have talked to Kerry about Cuba and Kerry said, I'm not sure I'd bother to do it again. One of the weaknesses there was it was kind of a one man show with Ben Rhodes. There wasn't a, a strong uh, foreign policy uh underpinning to it. I think it was a, a very interesting exercise in guerrilla diplomacy, but it maybe lacked, uh, well, I think provably what the executive branch can do, it can undo. And Donald Trump unwound most of the things that uh, Barack Obama did and went a, went a couple of steps further in some cases, like activating the Helms-Burton lawsuits. I think it serves as a lesson that we've got to end the embargo, uh, this ping pong back and forth. Uh, and thinking about businesses again, which is our topic tonight, uh, business likes a settled and secure environment. They don't want to put several million dollars into a uh, food processing plant in Cuba and then find out that the next president, Ron DeSantis, uh, cancels it out, right? They may grandfather it, but you can never be sure. So that's why I think we should just stop fooling around and end the damn embargo. And I argued this forcibly when Biden was elected and some of my fellow travelers said, well, that's just going a bit too far, you know? No, it isn't. It's the necessary step. 
Meg, back to you. What? <laughs> is it back to, back to uh, Meg? Back to Meg. Okay. Uh, we have a long, complicated question from Modin. I'm going to uh, mash up this last name, Orishevich, uh, who is an MD. And he asks, Cuba has a biotech sector that he has followed. Can someone talk about the biotech sector in Cuba specifically is there any interest or window of opportunity for the development, investment, cooperation with Cuba to develop generic biologicals such as insulin for the US or other Western markets? In addition, he asks, could this begin with Cuban government state-owned companies, dedicated spin-offs, or private startups? If not, what would be the first step? What are the impediments? What must change? And that's the end of the rather large question. So who wants to begin? Well, Gustavo? well, I can tell you it's very easy from the perspective of, uh, of MIPIMES, that uh, area of economic activity is excluded. Uh, from the list of activities that uh, that BP is can engage in. Uh, there have been efforts by a number of U.S. companies. I know, Bob, you probably have a better grasp of this. Uh, companies have tried to approach the Cuban government to do, to do research. There's a cancer institute up in Buffalo, New York, that has been in dancing with Cubans for a number of years. Uh, so there are ways of doing it, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, just in general, my sense, even in the United States, uh, biotechnology uh, is an area that is highly regulated. There's a lot of um, a lot of execution risk, uh, and it's just difficult to to get into. Uh, Bob, do you have any experience with with pharma companies? Well, there there have been some hopeful uh, joint ventures where uh, U.S. companies have teamed under license from OFAC to produce medicines in Cuba. Uh, some I'm blanking on what they are. I think there was a lung cancer treatment, some burn treatments, things of that sort. So it can be done. Uh, medicines and medical devices uh, are, there's a general policy of denial of all exports to Cuba, except the exceptions I talked about. But oh, uh, the Commerce Department does say exceptions to this general policy may be granted for medicines and medical devices but also items to meet the needs of the Cuban people, including exports to state-owned enterprises, agencies, and other organizations that pro provide goods and services for the use and benefit of the Cuban people. That will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's say that you wanted to take advantage of Cuba's uh, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, uh, I've been told that Cuba's industry is, is pretty much comparable to a small U.S. Pharma pharmaceutical company, which is impressive in a nation of 11 million people. And so if you wanted to avow yourself of that expertise with a view toward a longer association, you might want to start with some kind of medicines, therapies that provide, that would provide uh, goods and services for the benefit of the Cuban people. That's the way I would try to go about it. But it's a very good question, but a very difficult one. You know, I've always thought, obviously a fantasy, that if Cuba were to find, quote unquote, the cure for cancer, uh, the embargo would be over the next day. Yeah, I think that's right. Or a cure for baldness, for that matter. <laughs> Well, if I might intervene, we had a couple of years ago, one of the individuals uh, from the Buffalo Cancer Center um, speak in the Cuba program. And at that point, they had OFAC permission to do clinical trials of the Cuba cancer drug uh, to fight lung cancer. And those trials, I understand, uh, proceeded and have finished and 
at that point, uh, the Buffalo Cancer Center had signed an agreement with Cuba uh, in accord with US regulations uh, to explore the possibility of expanding the production of that particular drug uh, in the Mariel Enterprise Zone. And uh, it's unclear uh, to what degree that has proceeded, uh, but there was some progress in that respect. Um, our questionnaire also asked about organics, insulin, et cetera. Does anybody want to weigh in on that? To develop organic uh, medicines and what have you. Know, you. Again, uh, there's broad discretion to license these things. Uh, I won't go into some of the intricacies of the Cuba Democracy Act as it relates to medicines and medical devices, but just we have to begin with the premise that they can license whatever they want to. OFAC can license cooperation, investment, anything it wants to. So it finally comes down to an argument on the merits that it's good for the Cuban people, it's good for the American people. And then uh, you've got that awful, awful final calculus. Does it produce revenue for the government of Cuba? You know, uh, I would suggest that that consideration ought to be abandoned in the case of, of drugs that treat human maladies. So I think you could, yeah. You know, I think you could okay. do it. Uh, the questionnaire has one final element to his question, and that is, what would be the first step? Huh. Uh, do you want to weigh in on that one? Higher uh, uh, well, I think your first step, if you're if you're an American uh, business, is you've got to start with Cuban ministries. If you're going to Belgium or if you're going to Switzerland, you would meet with Bayer. If you're going to Cuba, uh, healthcare is entirely a state industry. So you would go to somebody out there in the internet land knows what it is. It would be the Ministry of Public Health, I suppose, and then it's subdivisions uh, down to the Institute of Biotechnology, I guess. Gustavo, any final word on this? No, no, I think uh, Bob has said it all. Okay, then we'll move to Jay Brickman, uh, who asks, uh, could you comment on the role of the Center for Economic Transformation and the opening of a Russian trading house? Gustavo, do you want to say anything about that? I really, I mean, I, I just saw some news on it. I really don't know anything about it. I don't know anything more than uh, the comment here, the comment has been, it would be Cuba's way of managing a private sector. Uh, instead of following a Vietnam or Chinese policy of the sector is empowered to, to develop, to use its best business judgment, that it's more a, more a state capitalism role where the government would prefer certain businesses over others, try to match it with, uh, with the needs of the nation. I have a, uh, I don't think that's ever worked. So, but uh, there's talk about Putin resuming some real aid to Cuba. So I hope it doesn't take that direction. Well, let me add, I mean, I, I, I don't know much about it, but in theory, it should be concerning uh, to Americans, to the American administration. Uh, I think uh, how ironic it is, and, and Bob, you did a nice walking through a history tour of us cuban relations. I'm reminded how we used to have, and I think we still have a list of things that we demanded the Cubans do uh, before we would even consider lifting any part of the embargo. And one of them was to kick the Russians out of Cuba. I don't know if you remember that or not. And I just haven't, I just think it's so ironic if 20 something years after they left or 30 something years after they left, here they are uh, inching back in and we are doing absolutely nothing to discourage them or 
uh, provide greater incentives for the Cuban government uh, to be looking in our direction as opposed to the Russians. It's just, you know, it's just ironic uh, that, that would be the case. Okay. On the um, side, just with Jay Brickman for a moment, uh, I'd like to congratulate him. Uh, shipping companies, shipping uh, farm produce, in many cases, into the Port of Marielle were sued under Title III of the Helms-Burton Act for trafficking in the emotive language. Of, there's somebody, a very old woman, claims she owned the Port of Marielle. And uh, uh, Jay and his colleagues just got a pretty good knockdown in that case that was dismissed because the judge felt that she hadn't gone anywhere nearly as close to proving ownership of any part of Mary Ellis was, was required. So congratulations to Jay and Crowley. Okay. Uh, Bowden has a follow-up question. Um, he's launching a program in sustainable development. He's a clinical immunologist and is developing a program to develop biotechnology expertise in places it is needed. Think vaccines, biodiversity, restorative agriculture, but also affordable insulin in the USA. And he would welcome further information and feedback. I Are we hoping, able to do that? <laughs> I was hoping people were gonna ask me about motorbikes to distribute. <laughs> <laughs> rise to their grandmothers in Camagüey. Uh, these are hard questions. I mean, it's a thorny subject, biotechnology. And I don't really claim to have much expertise in it. I think with the first question, I've pretty exhausted my fund of knowledge in this area. Yeah, I know. And again, if, it's, if it has to do with medicine or healthcare delivery, uh, those sectors are excluded uh, from the MIPIMAS uh, legislation. Um, if we're talking about, I forget what kind of organic um, agriculture uh, he mentioned, but there yeah. may, it may be possible uh, if it's a if it's a purely you know private sector um, EPME, uh to export, uh, but they can't export on their own. They have to be able to export through um, through a, a company an exporter that has a, a license uh, issued by the government, which is you know which makes sense. Yeah, uh, just to add. Uh, I think it would probably be most useful uh, for Bowden to contact uh, the Buffalo Cancer Center, which has been working with the Cubans uh, now for over 10 years. Uh, the biotechnology sector within Cuba is highly developed. Um, the lung cancer drug uh, has been uh, being used in Europe now for over 10 years with a high degree of positive results. Um, as I said, there have been extensive uh, clinical trials in the US which also have had positive results. So if you want somebody who knows how they got things done themselves, then I suggest you contact them in Buffalo. So from here, could we go back to uh, the issue of the smaller uh, non-state sector? Uh, there's been a lot of interest in whether or not the paladares, the private restaurants that had a considerable amount of success and were expanded, uh, particularly during the Obama administration, together with the uh, B&Bs uh, that got a shot in the arm even before uh, the Obama uh, mission with a uh, some cooperation uh, with US um, internet uh, companies. Um, would you like to talk about the possibility because the Cubans have placed a tremendous amount of emphasis on revitalizing the tourism sector if and when the restriction on tourism to Cuba uh, by the United States might occur. Well, I think uh, you want to start? 
or go ahead, Gustavo. Well, it's sort of what I said earlier, there was a lot of informal investments on the part of Cuban Americans, especially uh, to give money to their relatives, to cousins, to open up a paladar, a b and et cetera. Uh, but Bob, unless I misread the OFAC rules, none of that uh, is legal. Uh, and I doubt that anyone received a specific license for those kinds of investments. I think it was just something done that was very informal in the black market. There's a risk that, uh, first of all, I don't think, unless they are residents of Cuba, my understanding is they can't even have a property interest in real property uh, in, in Cuba. And so, um, you know, you you give $50,000 to to a cousin to establish a, a restaurant, the cousin disappears, the cousin dies, et cetera. Uh, now, what do you do? You know, what what court do you go to and prove that you have a, an interest uh, in this, um, you know, without being arrested? So I, I, I don't know. I don't think it really works all that well. When, uh, when I got the, when I represented the New York company that got the license to invest in the service industry in Cuba, uh, I heard back from Marco Rubio's office that they were very displeased about this, notwithstanding their constant clamor for uh, to support the private sector in Cuba. He became quite, the staffer became quite blunt and said, by US investors in Cuba, we mean Cuban Americans, right? So it's part of the great reclamation project. And uh, uh, the guy who, company was that got the license was of Czechoslovakian descent. And he said, so uh, I don't count because I'm Czechoslovakian. And Rubio's guy is supposed to have said, no, you don't count. It's Cuban Americans. So uh, the money that went in, and it's it, Rick Newcomb, a well-known, he was head of OFAC for probably 25 years. I was in a meeting once with when Jeff Flake and some other people had a congressional working group and Flake asked Newcomb at a meeting, have you ever one time uh, sought a civil penalty against a Cuban American for violating the travel ban? And he shrugged and said, no, right? Uh, so it's a little bit of a uh, interesting warp in the embargo. It seems to fall more heavily. Now, if you had, if you were not Cuban American and OFAC caught you shipping pizza ovens to Paladars in Cuba, I dare say you'd be in a lot of trouble. But it seems if it goes via, to your brother-in-law that it's okay. I, I, I'm so opposed to the embargo in every form that I applaud these guys and their pizza ovens. But you raise an interesting question that that investment was never regularized by or legitimized by either the US or Cuba. So your investment's about as good as your relationship with that person that you invested in. And he might be on a raft to Cuba, uh, to Florida by now, you know, so. Uh, there's the Cuba program at Columbia University published in 2018, a volume in English and in Spanish by Rafael Velazquez of Cuba and a Spanish member of the international, one of the international commissions on disputes between investors and governments that was focused on Cuba. Uh, perhaps the most interesting element of that was the fact that um, most of the disputes that went before the international commissions, um, which were settled in the foreign investors' favor, Cuba respected virtually all of them. So that's uh, one issue, historical note, that may be of interest. I am having trouble pulling up the Q&As. They are not, let's see. Hmm. I think you just asked Natalie, Natalia Delgado's question. Yeah. Philip Brenner is next. Uh, can you can you read that, yeah. says, Gustavo? Because my Q and A is not working. Sure. It says, "Can either of the speakers?" And thanks for to both for a very informative session.
identify where in the Cuban government the greatest opposition to economic reform is coming from. Could you repeat the last six words? In other words, the, 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 the opposition to the economic reforms in Cuba, where is it coming from within the Cuban leadership, within the cupola of either the Communist Party or the, or the government? I'll attempt an answer, but I think you may be better informed than I am. Uh, you might say that the bureaucracy of Cuba defeated Raul Castro. Uh, it can be, it can dig in and be highly obstructive when it wants to be. Now, I haven't heard any public denunciations of the law because Cuba doesn't work that way. But I'm sure that there are a lot of people in the Cuba, buried in the Cuban ministries that uh, would be opposed to this sort of thing. That, uh, you know, there is a communist party of Cuba, right? And uh, there are people that still fervently believe that the means of production ought to be with the state. They don't hide the, the small, micro, small, and medium sized businesses. What is the synonym for that? I think it would be petty bourgeoisie, wouldn't you? So <laughs> I can see why some diehards in Cuba wouldn't be that supportive. Mm -hmm. Do you have any take on that, Gus? No, I mean, if you look at, uh, I don't want to get too abstract, but sort of the, the theory of political change around the world, uh, typically it's taken one individual, right? Uh, you saw in, in Russia or the uh, USSR with Gorbachev, who almost single-handedly uh, just brought a brand new paradigm. Now, that, of course, was on top of a very dire economic situation that was going on uh, in Russia at the time. And you saw in, um, in China, after Mao died, within a couple of years, Deng Xiaoping became the premier. And he was somebody who was, um, you know, as we know now, a great reformer. And he did some things on purpose to make sure that the Chinese uh, officials and everyone in the country would support uh, drastic economic reforms. I, I, I saw for the second time uh, the other day a Netflix um, documentary entitled How China Became Rich. And I was just reminded of, of that point, how important it is how it, you know, for a single individual to have a lot of power, notwithstanding in the case of the of the Chinese Revolution, which of course uh, took place in 1949, um, so in that sense, the Cuban Revolution is uh, less uh, solidified <laughs> than the Chinese Revolution. Uh, but he was able to bring a transformation. But he did it. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, we think it made a lot of sense, and I think that he was proven right. But it took a lot of courage. It took a lot of political, um, you know, skill to be able to have people around him, you know, so support him. But he got it done. Um, so I don't know what that means about about Cuba, why it's been able to do this or not do this. Uh, Robert, you're right. I mean, Cuba is at the end of the day and continues to be a socialist state, uh, and there are a lot of people in the, in the in the Cuban government who ideologically are socialist. They believe in heavy intervention on the part of the government in the state or the state in the in the society, um, and they ascribe their anemic economic uh, performance. Uh, to the embargo, which they call the blockade. So it becomes an alibi. And other than bad weather, they blame everything on the embargo. And the, there's no question the embargo has had a crushing effect. Uh, it was designed to have a crushing effect on the Cuban economy, and it has had that effect, uh, certainly. And you combine that with COVID and the effect it had on tourism. Um, you know, I think a lot, that's what it helps explain why a lot, I think a lot of people chose, have been choosing to, to leave you know, Cuba. Uh, so there are just a lot of people who just don't, believe that this is the right way to go. But I think that also is reflecting the fact that two things. One, it took such a long time for this law to be uh, adopted. Uh, and then two, uh, the fact that it, you know, like I said, it, 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 you know, it's 10% or 15% uh, of, uh, of the loaf of bread, as far as I'm concerned. But it's at least, it's, at least we can identify this a loaf of bread. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, because my Q&A app is not working, could you read the next? There are quite a few questions. Sure. If you could um, throw a couple at us, we would appreciate it. The next one is from uh, Lucia Bilbao, who in fact is very late where she is. Hello from uh, Spain. First of all, thank you so much for your um, 
explanations and reflections. Secondly, I wanted to ask you about your opinion on the arrival of social media in Cuba and how it may help to affect the development of the formal economy uh, as, the, as the informal market has a big role in different social media platforms. Um, I mean, I'll just take a quick crack at that. I, you know, social media has transformed the way that everyone does business and communicates all over the world. Um, a smart Cuban government would use it in its platform uh, in order to uh, teach people about these um, these reforms, about getting getting entrepreneurs involved in training, make the case for you know incentivizing them for going into these areas, maybe even connecting on a on a B two B basis, uh, entrepreneurs. There's a lot that the government can do, uh, and people who uh, and entrepreneurs uh, who want to promote this, this sector as well. Bobby. Yeah, I think also beyond uh, beyond the political dialectic about the reform, if that's the right word, anyway, the empowerment of private businesses. When I was in Cuba, I was interested in how much of the distribution going on is done via the internet, right? So. Don't ask me about social media, where it begins and ends, but I think a great deal of the marketing and execution will be done uh, through websites and things like that. Okay. I have, uh, Do you have anything to say on that? No. Sorry? No, no, I was going to say that the next question is from a, a friend uh, in Havana, Rainier Schultz, who runs um, the, uh, the, the, the Casa. Um, the consortium of yes, that's right. I'm sorry. Of universities that have exchange programs in Cuba. Go ahead. Right. Yes. There's a quick uh, comment. Um, not question from Havana. I congratulate Meg, the Cuba program at Columbia, and the panelists for this wonderful and informative panel. We at Casa Cuba Program Center in Havana, of which Columbia is part of, uh, just received a new group of U.S. students, many from Columbia today. I invite you and suggest uh, some future discussions, uh, have Cuban dis uh, discussions, you know, people from the island uh, to these panels. For example, a young, young entrepreneurs, Cuban economist and use of a center for a local international uh, component of these necessary conversations. I, I think that's a very good idea. I visited Rainier at his center some months ago and I'm impressed by the, by the caliber of students that they have there. Um, you know, many of them um, Cuban Americans, but also non-Cuban Americans from the United States, from some of the best universities in the world, who've chosen to spend um, at least a semester in Cuba, immerse themselves in that society, and really learn from within. You know what's what's happening there. Yes, uh, excellent idea. Um, the exchange programs, Rainier. Uh, if you go back to uh, 2010 when the Cuba program began, and you check. The number of Cubans, uh, they far outweigh, outnumber the non-Cubans who have spoken in the Cuba program. And I'd be happy to provide you with the statistics, as a matter of fact. Gustavo, it's back to you since I'm cut off. Yeah, no, there are no more questions. Um, no more questions, nope. even though it says 10. Well, that might be including the ones that say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, but that includes at least at least I see in my my screen here ten. Most of, uh, some okay. of some of them are just a a couple of comments that didn't, didn't need to be uh, mentioned. Okay, uh, and um, and so I think that that's it. Well, I think we have actually uh, covered the territory very well indeed, and that is and obviously uh, most of the credit goes to our speakers this evening. Gustavo Arnavat uh, from the Cuba Foundation and Bob Muse from Bob Muse, his own uh, bufete in Washington, D.C. Uh, two individuals who obviously have been following the issues very closely and for uh, many years. And so I want to thank them both. I also want to thank our support staff, uh, et cetera. And um, Hopefully at our next one, uh, I will be able to get into the questions and answers. <laughs>
et cetera. But Gustavo, thank you for taking over. You were uh, obviously uh, the person we needed at this point. Okay, and so I will say good night to all of the uh, speakers and the sports staff, as well as the audience. Uh, thank you for your attendance. And I hope that you will join us on March 21st when we will have a new webinar, Exodus, and the two speakers will be Guillermo Grenier from Florida International University and Susan Eckstein from Boston University. Thank you for coming tonight. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Astrid, are you there? Yes, I am. Just wanted to check with you. That what I happened? To, what webinar. happened to me? <laughs> can you? Is it okay for me to end the webinar? I uh, yes, but can.